Bhagavato Sama Sambuddhasa Namatasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namatasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Sad homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay. <clears throat> so, you know, the Eightfold Path, um, in order to look at it first, we have to back up and say, what is it this was doing? And this is looked at as the guidance path for support material for you to support you to be able to reach path and to be able to go down to path so and we back up uh, everybody i'm seeing i uh, one person i might not know is ku i don't know who ku is if ku have you been practicing twim because this is all geared to twim have you been practicing twim ku Hello, Ku. I'm not sure who that is, but okay, if it's someone who has not been practicing, um, you know, Twim, I'm gonna preface this just a little bit so they'll know what's going on. If we were to put in a nutshell, uh, and this is what professors try to do now in talking about what exactly Buddha Gautama did what did he find and uh, how did he do it? What was his intention? And I, I have to speak from my own perspective that I believe that he was an extremely compassionate character. And with this compassion that he decided to go towards a, a quest after he was exposed to the suffering that he saw when he went out of the complex where he was living. When you, when you visit Kapilavatu where he grew up, okay, you see that there's a moat around the whole thing, a double moat around the property, and that he was inside, and this was his entire world, and they kept him, they guarded him from Your voice is breaking up. Your voice is breaking up. Right. Let, me, let me just check. Can you the, check um, the internet? Our, yeah. Okay, will you check geo for me? The geo power? Supposed to be very good right now, according to the colors. Uh huh? Okay. And then I can try Panchashio. Okay, go for, uh, to switch to geo then. Huh? Panchashio is not working, then switch to it. Now look at Panchashil, that's stronger. No, I, I currently it is go, okay. Uh, your voice is not breaking. Currently it is going to go well. All right, I'm in Panchashil, okay? okay? Okay. Okay, then keep it. So in recent times, people have started to try to encapsulate what he did and why and when he was let out of his complex with Chanda, his uh, groom that was the person that took him out of the temple to see what was outside. He went out to see what was outside. And he saw four things. He saw someone who was sick and he saw someone uh, who died and he saw uh, a great deal of suffering. And also he saw a monk so there was actually four things. I'm missing one. <laughs> Does anybody tell me what I'm missing? Ulysses, can you remember? <laughs> okay, so he saw a person who was sick. Oh, okay, a person who was growing old, like me. <laughs> okay, he saw a person who was growing old and he saw a person who was suffering with the ailments and pain of growing old. Then he saw, as uh, the second one, he saw someone who was sick and he had not been allowed to see anyone who was sick growing up. You can imagine how it was for them to protect him and make sure he didn't see anything. And there's all kinds of stories about this. What did they do with members of the family who got sick or who were dying? What did they do with them? Did they move them out and put them somewhere where he would not be allowed to go? What happened? 
no one knows. But then uh, he also saw one, someone who died and there was a funeral that he witnessed. It was very upsetting to him. But on the way back, he saw a monk. He saw a monk who was sitting under a tree and who was very calm and very quiet. And, and then he went back in the palace. He makes his decision to leave. He was seeking a quest. At this point, he's nearly 28 years old. I believe he's 28 or so years old when this takes place. And of course, Yasodra is pregnant and men do go out and do things when women are pregnant. And he went on this trip and he figured this out. He comes back and uh, he makes the decision that he's gonna go on the quest, you see. And Rahula is born and then just shortly after he meets with his parents and tells them. And of course, his father's disappointed because he's the son that was going to take over the kingdom. But when he leaves, he leaves for all humanity. There's no way around this that he leaves for Buddhists because there were none. You can't point to one group. He didn't want to go into contradiction with people. He really just wanted answers. And so he starts his quest and it takes him over six years. And we all know this story. You put this whole thing in a nutshell with what he found. And he, he found a solution for relief of suffering. But the way that he did this was that he ends up, uh, he was of course practicing yoga, of course practicing exercise and as a young man, very fit and everything. But this is all having to do with the body, all having to do with the body. And he figures out the Nama Rupa connection that uh, we learn about in dependent origination, the mind body connection. And he figures out uh, an experiment that he runs. You know, I have often taught you um, Majima Nikaya number 19, because um, in that sutta, uh, you see where he ran an experiment monks before I was uh, enlightened, when I was only a bodhisattva, I saw that the world was in trouble. I saw that there were uh, unwholesome things and wholesome things. And he gets curious. It's almost like a teenager in a science fair who wants to do a simple experiment, okay? And so he decides he wants to experiment with what it's like to, uh, to live uh, in an unwholesome mind states. And does it pay off? And it doesn't pay off. And then he looks at the wholesome and it really seems to pay off. And he feels better and he's happier and people like being around him and all of this. And so one a professor at um, in Paradinia University of Paradinia, uh, he made the conclusion, this whole thing was a behavioral modification program of moving someone, showing you how you could change. And it's interesting because today we're very hot and heavy in the research in uh, cognitive psychology and in neurocognitive science to understand consciousness, but also to understand not just where consciousness is, but be un be the behavioral modification therapy is a form of therapy that I consider extremely extremely successful baby steps in the direction of the wholesome and changing your life, okay? And rather than going backwards to talk about everything that happened before, which was another approach, instead of going back through all that, learning the difference between your energy being put in the past, your energy being put in the future, and the value of living in the present time. And he comes and he formulates all of this back there 2,500 years ago. And he's right there with the research that's happening in 2021 right now. So this is absolutely fascinating to me. And he came up with a, uh, some of the things that are here in, when we go through the text, we're gonna do a run through the text when we do this and track the way we did with some of the other items that were in the, uh, the, and this is the last group that appears in the 37 requisites or 37 aids as somebody named it, 37 aids for enlightenment. And it's a support structure, yeah? 
Now this, I want you to think of it, I'm asking you to think of it as um, in order for you to create the conditions needed, once you go to, you reach path and you're quiet enough to get yourself lined up with path and you start to go through the levels of the path. Remember how we talked about the different uh, Rupa Jhanas and the uh, Rupa Jhanas and the passage down the path to reach cessation. We said that it's like a waterfall and the conditions must be right for the person to fall from one level into another, into another, into another. And the hole underneath the waterfall has to fill up first, meaning the conditions have to become right for a movement from each level into the deeper, deeper, deeper. We have uh, Ganika Mogalana, the accountant who talks about teaching, uh, I teach my, uh, the Buddhist having a discussion about how he teaches his accountants and how he teaches his monks. And he says, I teach a gradual teaching with a gradual practice and gradual progress down to the last step of the staircase. So it's going deeper, 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 more and more still, more and more quiet. And we're learning, we're gradually learning the importance of uh, what this practice is about is letting everything go and not having any personal concern for it. All these things are things I want you to keep in mind as we go through this and you hear what we're talking about with these. So first I'm gonna give you, uh, I, I wasn't sure how to do this, but first I'm gonna give you, um, go from our practice angle toward listening to what it, we put in your uh, book, uh, in the retreats concerning the Eightfold Path, reviewing the teaching of the Eightfold Path with the eight pieces, then we're gonna dive into the text. And as we do that, I want you to keep in mind, does TWIM, the Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation, does it actually pay attention to fulfill, helping you, supporting you to reach the different levels of these pieces that we're talking about in the text the same way it does it fulfill it. So first listen to me go through the pieces with you from our trainings. The first one is right view. And we call this, we say that it is practiced as harmonious perspective. You wanna write this down if you want to. And this is Samaditi. It's Sama, S-A-M-M-A -M -M -A is always a Sama and the Ditti, Sama Ditti is D-I-T-T-H-I. So a smile leads us to developing this right view. It helps you to start viewing life through a more impersonal lens perspective. So viewing uh, our impersonal perspective is our impersonal view. Now this is directly concerning Atta in this first uh, one, the first uh, fold. And remember, this is a fold. I want you to remember this image also, that if we have a single piece of paper, if we, if we pull out just a single piece of paper, and I've probably done this with you uh, before, and you fold the paper in half like this, okay? Like that, and we fold it again, okay? and we fold it one more time, okay? And when we fold it really tightly like that, so we have now, if we do it, crease it really tight like that, then we open it up and we have this little accordion and then we flip them back so that they will open up as a fan. We make sure that they're all folded uh, the right way. Like they line up, they don't cover each other. And the, and the interesting part that Bonnie showed us one time on the mountain was um, that you have to be very careful that you understand they're giving you eight ingredients for the support that's being offered in the Eightfold Path. Okay, when I say that, think of it as this whole Eightfold Path is a cake and it has eight ingredients in it. So we can't fool around with taking ingredients out of the cake and then expecting the cake to turn out right, because it's not going to work so well. So an example is the Eightfold Path leads us to a practice that creates a fan like this, which I can now, I can take this and I can 
Uh, I have to turn this mirror thing around. I don't know why I flipped it, but it's driving me nuts. Hold on a second. Um, where do I go for this? Hmm. There. Okay. It gets me really confused when I move my right hand and it's over here. <laughs> so I have to make sure this is right. Okay, so when you have eight folds and you fan yourself, get a load of that. I can feel the air and I can get cooler, okay? However, if I were to remove three of these folds, the first three folds, and take them off, and then I were to open this up, it would only come open this wide, that's all. So I would have to work really hard <laughs> to get any air. And then you, so the point is, we're trying to show you that because today, and I've been reading up on this and I don't think this was anything intentional. I think it was a misunderstanding. And I think it was uh, English's second language poss possibly caused this maybe with Asian teachers, I don't know. But there is nothing that I can find that says we should remove three of these pieces, okay. They, they should all be there. And so there, there is, a, however, there is a section that we will hit, we will probably run into it in this lesson in the text that actually did say that there is a, the division of importance with the three at the top, the three uh, right view, right thought and right speech and then you take uh, right action, right livelihood as a second group. And then you take right effort, right mindfulness and right, right concentration as the third group. All right, the, the division is noted in a sutta, but not in, there's nothing implied there that says we should remove three of them and play with five of them and expect it to work. So, I mean, all the time I'm talking to, you know, I'm always curious and I'm always looking for why we are not normally in most of the most of what's being taught today. Why are people not being able to reach Sotapanna more easily and Sakadagami and to understand the attainment door is really open and understand path is real and you can get to it and you can actually mirror what's being described in the text. So I guess as Americans, we fell into this thing of let's look at the text and be real sincere. If the actual instructions are in there, can we find them? So they work and work would mean to work or not to work would mean actually the results they're talking about, would they still take place? That's, it's very pragmatic. The approach we've come, you know, where Bonte went into this, a very pragmatic way of examining it. And it was my, my uh, being pulled into all of this in the beginning was very pragmatic. I wanted to know if anybody had a solution for the management of personal suffering. And then if there was one, could you apply it and share it with other people? Does it still work the same way it's described? So that's, that's what's been the, the total guidance system for finding these things, okay? So you understand. So right view is the first one. And we say a smile leads to developing right view. And it helps you to start viewing life through a more impersonal lens, which needed in a clear sense of humor. What's, what's needed is a really clear sense of humor uh, that leads you to a happier life. That's what this is all about. It's about relieving stress, relieving pressure, and changing a person's behavior. And the professor that was at uh, University of Paradinia, he said, basically, you know, this is like a modification of behavior that he created, changing people's reactions to what is experienced by the six sense doors to a response. So it's a reaction response training program in a way, this matches up with your modification, uh, behavior modification therapy. Okay, so the next one is right thought. And we don't say right thought. We like to say it's practiced as harmonious imaging. And this one is sama samkapa. 
And once again, a smile is a harmonious image to help keep your mind lighter. And smiling lightens the mind and sharpens awareness. This is what they know in the research for clearer thinking and smarter decisions. The third one is right speech, samavacha. It's V-A-C-A, -A, sama vacha. And it is practiced as harmonious communication. And we communicate with, how do we communicate is what's important, okay? This is harmonious communication. But remember, human beings also, they communicate in three ways. They communicate with our mind, with our speech, and with our body. And so we have professional people who write books for us about body language and what it means when you're in human resources and you're in uh, communication work or you are in corporate work, you have to watch a person's body language to really know what they're saying. So this, uh, it, the communicate, we communicate with our mind, our speech and body and a smile helps us stay on track, calms us. It calms us and levels us, keeps us on track. So uh, who do you communicate most often with in your life? That's a big question. Yourself, yourself. And that's another part of this communication. You have this verbal, the verbal does not just mean speaking, but the verbal, verbal analysis that goes on constantly in your mind, the running of the mind, runaway mind. This is mental proliferation. The next one is right action, samakamanta, K-A-M-A-N-T-A. And this is practiced as harmonious movement of mind's attention. And that leads to a wholesome uh, set of actions and it leads to a smile. And when you practice, you notice how mind's attention impersonally moves. You start watching how it's all an impersonal process. And when you smile, people tend to be more kind and helpful without stress or tension coming back at you. If whatever you put out, you get back. This is karma going back and forth. You keep your inner smile alive and well. Keep it inside alive and well. Match it up, line it up with the present time, with that space, that present time space, and keep it alive, keep it well. The fifth one is right livelihood. Sama Ajiva. A-J-I-V-A is the Pali word. And in it's practiced as harmonious lifestyle. You try, try smiling even when things sometimes fall off track. You can do that, you know, if you understand a Nietzsche really well, you understand whatever's happening is going to pass away. So whatever arises passes away. So we have Shakespeare out there saying, ah, this too shall pass away. Yeah, see? So if you keep your smile going, you can get through just about anything. Trust me, this is true. Always remember, change, the Anicca is around the corner. There it is. And you keep up your sense of humor about your situation and it will become easier. Life is not happening to us. It's not happening to us. It is happening from us. So instead of thinking, think, if you believe that thing, everything is happening to me, it becomes heavier and heavier and heavier and pushes you down, okay? But if you consider a different angle, what if it's happening from us? What does that mean? It means I can choose. I have volition. That is choice of will and choice of view. And your choice of view is how do you see what's happening? Smiles can change our direction. You need to keep laughing at grabbing on to the negative. Laugh at it. I'm taking it all so seriously. And yet what somebody is yelling at you or putting you down or pushing you or punishing you or being cruel to you or anything, 
is actually them being very angry and hateful to themselves and you seem to be a target and that's really what's happening. If you look closely, that's actually what's going on. We can take a hundred different examples of that and you can say, yeah, the person who, who grabs the person, hurts the person on the street and runs away is not really hateful toward the person but to themselves and hurting themselves. But life starts shifting when we start smiling more. And that's something that Vanti really, really puts forward. Keep smiling. I remember once I wrote, um, I was supposed to write the short version out from a talk he did for the instructions for Meta, the 10 minute version. I had to write it almost 10 times. Why? Because every time I took it to him and said, okay, here it is, he read, no, he said, go and put at least 10 more smiles, more smiles. But so in that, instead of instructions for 10 minute instructions for Meta, you say the word smile 13 or 14 times is what it is actually. And then he said, go back and put the smile word in bold and make it a bigger font. <laughs> He's trying to make you understand when you read it. Quotes is not good enough. You know, underlining is no good. Bold, bigger, smile. Just keep smiling because that's what relaxes your head. And that's what sharpens your observation power. Right effort. We get to this right effort. Samawayama. V A Y. A M A Samawayama is practiced as harmonious practice. This definitively is a practice. It cannot be overlooked when you read it. Um, we'll get to that in the text. We'll read it over once and you'll see that there are two ways of interpreting that. And if you don't understand what it is, you could come out with the destructive way, the hard way. But there is a lighter way to go with it just by understanding what it actually was and was four steps to recognize when mind is caught by an unwholesome thought or feeling and the attention starts to move number two to release mind's attention off of it and relax your head and that comes from the instructions in anapana sati sutta which is the best preserved set of anywhere for actually doing meditation regardless of the object that has the full set of what should be going on and it was taken from there and then number three redirect your mind's attention back to the smile and metta for yourself and others and number four now keep this going and keep developing more mind states that have this smile in them, in everything you do, everything that you exchange with people, everything. So the next one, the next seventh one is right mindfulness, samasati. Uh, the sati is the mindfulness, S-A-T-I, and is practiced as harmonious observation. We translate the Mindfulness meaning an observation, a specific kind of observation. We can see things more clearly when we keep smiling. That's true. And our disposition affects our focus on any task. That's true. So if you smile into what you do and you help, mind's attention will become sharper. Now, if you catch yourself getting too heavy or too serious, you need to just laugh. And I'm saying, ha, <laughs> you know, and it's just to yourself. If somebody's there, you don't want to laugh and have them think you're laughing in their face. You're not, but you keep smiling. And, and you know, when it's gone, when it's done, it's like, okay, Anicca, <laughs> that's it, Anicca. That's what it was. Just laugh at how caught you get. Forgive yourself, smile, and, and move on. You find what, is, what you are really good at, and you do what you love, and you love what you do. This is your message from Bhante into life. You just figure out 
what you're really good at, what you like doing, and whatever you love doing, that's what you're going to be the best at doing. This is the way it was in school, wasn't it? Your best subject was the one that you really liked the most. That's what you need to try to find in life. It isn't easy. You don't always find it right away. But you keep smiling about that and letting it go because at some point you're going to figure it out. Next one is right concentration. But we say sama samadhi um, and we say harmonious collectedness. Also, we say samadhi. Uh, samadhi didn't mean concentration precisely in the time the Buddha was teaching. We take the word sama and divide it as sama and d, sama plus d. And we say part of it was the sama, uh, samata that was in his practice, and the d was a movement towards wisdom. So it was like tranquil wisdom. The tranquility also comes from the relaxed step in the instructions for the meditation. So this is a, the, what you're hunting for is in harmonious collectedness. You're hunting for a productive level and tone of concentration that is not too tight and not too loose. Not really tight, not too loose. So insights can arise more easily because the condition for the arising of insights is a particular tone and quality of the concentration. An inner smile supports this productive level. Remain alert and calm, and you will be able to observe the deeper states. You can let go more easily now and sleep better too when you know that you have been smiling. That's what that's about, okay? Now, at the end of this, we're going to, I'm going to give you one more thing out of this book that we put together for the retreats, and that's called a checkup list, uh, a checkup for progress on the Noble Eightfold Path. Okay, so now I'm going to take you through, oh boy, <laughs> we're going to go for a trip through the text a little bit, and the first place we're going to go is, um, and I want you to think about your practice, especially if you're using metta, because when we teach you the metta and uh, the Brahma Viharas, we're showing you the power of the Brahma Viharas. Practicing metta in recitation and as groups in communities or for someone's health to help them and everything, very good idea, very great idea to do together as a community exercise. But for the actual discovery and development of the Brahma Viharas, each one of the pieces, the Metta, the Karuna, the Mudita, and the Upeka had its own power, its own purpose, and its own gift for you. It's like you have uh, a kind of light inside you that is shut down as you get to an altered and sort of suffocated from all the busyness and filled your fullness of your mind and your head, you're just kind of suffocated from it. And you want to reclaim, reclaim it. It's like a, a kind of childlike wonderment that is lost when we get to be adults, but it's still inside you. That's the thing, it's still inside you, but you're not in touch with it anymore, okay? So uncovering that the Brahma Viharas has this wonderful power of if you're practicing loving kindness, then you can have no thoughts of ill will arising in your mind. And then when you're practicing, it turns into Karuna and you're practicing the Karuna, you can have no thoughts of cruelty anymore. And when Mudita comes up and arises, there can be uh, no thoughts of, uh, um, this is where the joy comes up. There can be no thoughts of discontent because when you have joy come up inside of you you cannot walk around with discontent on your face about the situation with COVID and this and that and everything else it doesn't pop up it's not going to come up because you're happy and when you're happy that's not going to come into play yeah and the last one is equanimity when the equanimity develops it shuts down the aversion to everything so this is a very powerful thing 
we don't usually get into that when we're doing recitation or we're doing um, Karaniya Metta Visalena the Sutta. We talk about it, but talking about it is on this intellectual level here. And we're trying to go deeper and deeper and deeper into the mind, waking up our heart mind connection, waking up and letting out hopefully some of that smile and some of that light and letting it, letting it out. And so here, I'm going to read to you first, Majima Nikaya number three. And I'm going to read to you um, a couple paragraphs here. And this is number eight first. <clears throat> it says, friends, the evil here in a person is greed and hate. There is a middle way for the abandoning of greed and hate and giving vision, giving knowledge, which leads to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment and to Nibbana. He's talking, the Buddha is talking now. He's on, we're on page 100. The Buddha is talking about the way he's teaching. And what is that middle way? The middle way he talks about so often. It is just this eightfold path that is right view, right intention. Well, we'll do, you know, harmonious, Im harmonious perspective, a harmonious imaging, harmonious communication, harmonious movement of mind's attention, harmonious lifestyle, harmonious practice, harmonious observation, and harmonious um, collectedness of mind. This is the middle way, giving that was is giving vision, giving knowledge that leads to peace, to direct knowledge and enlightenment and to Nibbana. When we say it gives us knowledge, giving knowledge, you're growing knowledge as you the vision you're seeing, you're creating knowledge and vision is occurring, and which is the way the Buddha taught. He wanted you to see it, and that's where you grow the knowledge, the knowledge and vision. Hello? Okay. Which leads, okay, which leads to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, and to Nibbana. Okay? So the direct knowledge comes from the action of knowledge and seeing, knowing by seeing. Okay? And then the evil herein is anger and resentment. It is contempt and insolence. It is envy and avarice. It is deceit and fraud. It is obstinacy, stubbornness means, okay, and rivalry. It is conceit and arrogance. It is vanity and it is negligence. So he's describing the various problems that are eliminated through the practice. This is the middle way for the abandoning of vanity and negligence and giving vision and giving knowledge and of all these things, abandoning it, all these things, which leads to the practice of peace and direct knowledge, enlightenment and Nibbana. And that is what is in the middle way. And then they point the middle way is the path of using the Eightfold Path. That's the, uh, the way we introduce this whole thing, okay? So the next one, place that we go is we go over to Sutta number nine and we're on uh, page 134. Now, this one, of course, gives you the classic standard piece in section 18. And I just want you to see that part one time because this is what's throughout the text again and again and again. And it basically, and what is the way leading to the cessation of suffering? It is just this noble eightfold path and it recites the parts. And this is called the way leading to the cessation of suffering. It gets pretty clear by the way they're indicating this throughout the whole text. This is something we keep going all the time in life. It's not something reserved for retreats. It's not, uh, you know, we have a thing right now where we don't have a lot of discipline 
with the way people approach investigations sometimes. And they want to think about using the retreats as stepping stones and that's all they need to do, but they don't need to do anything else in life, uh, you know, uh, separated from just going to retreat maybe four times a year. But in between what happens to all the pieces that were the support pieces, it's kind of a game of two steps forward and one step back, two steps forward and one step back or more steps back. And then you have to catch up again because we try to mix it with life and we try to think we just wanna get what we can out of this. But if we're going to actually try to see what he was doing, we have to go all the way, but we don't have to become monastics. We do not have to become monastics to go very, very far and even into three of the attainments through up into anagami. You do not have to be a monastic. It's tough as an anagami, it gets very tough, but is a sotapanna and sakadagami with the fruitions is not, is a very healthy thing for life. Very, very healthy and helpful. So we also look here, um, when do we go back here? What did I do? Let's see. I said we had to look at 18. But then I think I said we had to look at three through eight also. Why? Okay. If you go back now to page 132, what I didn't want to skip in this when we look at um, Sutta number nine, I wanted you to really be clear on how important this whole thing was because the whole practice is based on wholesome and the unwholesome. So I wanted you to just listen to this bit here. When friends, a noble disciple or a student understands the unwholesome and the root of the unwholesome, the wholesome and the root of the wholesome. In that way, he is one who has harmonious perspective. So your practice is examining this step by step, what is wholesome, what is unwholesome. Every time you practice right effort is what comes to mind. And who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma and has arrived at that Dhamma, that person understands this part. And what friends is unwholesome? Now he's gonna tell you precisely. What is the root of the unwholesome? What is the wholesome? What is the root of the unwholesome? Killing living beings is unwholesome. Taking what is not given is unwholesome. Misconduct and sensual pleasures is unwholesome. False speech is unwholesome. Malicious speech is unwholesome. Harsh speech is unwholesome and gossip is unwholesome. Covetousness is unwholesome. Ill will is unwholesome. Wrong view is unwholesome. Taking things personally is unwholesome. This is called the unwholesome. And what is the root of the unwholesome? Greed is the root of the unwholesome. Hate is the root of the unwholesome. Delusion is the root of the unwholesome. This is called the root of the unwholesome. And what is delusion? What does delusion mean? Delusion is when you're taking everything personally. Delusion, moha, is the moha, okay? That is the atta, moving over into the atta perspective. So we embrace an anatta expression or a position and pursue that to cancel out the atta. This is called the root of the unwholesome. What is the wholesome? Abstention from killing living beings is wholesome. Abstention from taking what is not given is wholesome. Abstention if, from misconduct and sensual pleasures is wholesome. Abstention from false speech is wholesome. Abstention, abstention from malicious speech is wholesome. From harsh speech is wholesome. From gossip is wholesome. Uncovetousness is un, is wholesome. Uncovetousness, not non ill will. That is your meta. 
is wholesome. Right view is wholesome. This is called the wholesome. And so we're taking you to embrace the right direction. And what is the root of the wholesome? Non-greed is the root of the wholesome. Non-hate is the root of the wholesome. Non-delusion is the root of the wholesome. This is called the root of the wholesome. And when a noble disciple has thus understood the unwholesome and the root of the unwholesome and the wholesome and the root of the wholesome, his entirely, he entirely abandons the underlying tendency to lust. He abolishes the underlying tendency to aversion. He pulls out by the roots. That's what extirpate means. He pulls out by the root the underlying tendency to the view and conceit of I am, of everything is personal. That's what we're talking about. That's what you're talking about. And by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, he here and now makes an end of suffering. And in that way to a noble disciple is one of right view or impersonal perspective, whose view is straight, who has unwavering confidence in the Dhamma, has arrived at this true Dhamma. And why do we have, or how do we get this unwavering confidence in the Dhamma? You know, it works. <laughs> what else can I say? <laughs> it, this stuff really works. You know, I, I was talking to someone in Amsterdam who's getting ready to do some extraordinary sort of, uh, you know, uh, some good investigation work and research on this. And the whole point of this, he says, is if he can just prove certain things in certain directions, I know what he's working with. Uh, if you can show that that way, what you're really showing is this stuff is real. <laughs> You know, this stuff is totally real. And I always get such a kick out of it, you know, because people have made it so complicated and it's not complicated as we think it is. If, if, how can we, how can we make it less complicated for you? This is what I do for a living. I, I try and Bonte has tried for years to get simpler definitions, simpler definitions that will then all suddenly go like that. That's what we're after, you see? And did we do it haphazardly? Were we silly about it? No. Did we just come out and did we just say, this is what you need to do? No. We worked really hard. He worked really hard talking back and forth with people about this, you know, and then testing it on students for maybe half a year or more in retreats that were being happening all over the world until we found the word here, the word there that was going click, 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 boom. Yeah. So it's, it, it, one person said, you know, Satipatthana, it's just not real. It just isn't real. Nobody makes any, any, any uh, kind of uh, stuff. And I was talking with somebody about Satipatthana the other day, and I said, listen to me. Satipatthana Sutta is very important, very, very important. But here's the catch. If the results of you practicing Satipatthana the way you're hearing it be put together is not resulting in the last four paragraphs of the Satipatthana Sutta, and you need to go find it. The last four paragraphs, if that's not happening, something is just, it's not, nothing is wrong with the sutta. And the, the parts are very important to learn. But if they're not being explained in a way where they go like that, that's not happening. But when that starts happening, believe me, you will understand that the stuff was really real. And this friend of mine in, uh, you know, Kanyamita uh, in, uh, uh, Amsterdam is frustrated because he really wants people to see this is real. It's real. It's changed his life. It's changed my life. It's changed several people's lives. 
And that's all we're asking you to try to embrace these, uh, the way that we're giving you the definitions in stick with them because they are going like that. And we want you to discover that for yourself and not believe me. Don't believe me, true it, try to do it. You know, I had somebody come here last week and they said, you know, I have this tingling happening in the top of my head, tingling happening in the top of my head and my feet are going numb and they're itching so I know they're numb and stuff. What can I do? What can I do? I can't sit any more than maybe 20, 30 minutes. He's sitting an hour and a half now. All he needed was to have this, to be told why this is happening, how this is operating, why, what is happening. And when we go back through the parts of his practice, what's happening here and here and here and here step by step when you sit down to practice every day, then all of a sudden we know what is going wrong. And when you're violating the instructions, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. And you have to straighten it out. So that's all that the uh, Suttavada is about, going back to the text. And if the words are too hard here, then going to the thesaurus, which has the synonyms, the other words that mean the same thing that maybe you understand better. That's what we're doing. So you understand. Okay, now we go to the next one is 83 uh, and the section is 20. And this reflects the practice, the way we're doing it. So we want to look at this one. It is in section 21. Now I have to preface this by saying, okay, I have to preface this by saying what the suit is about, really. If you go back to the beginning of 83, it's on page 692. And this is interesting because this is King Makhav, Makhadeva, Makhadeva. He was a king who was a very righteous king ruling, ruled by the Dhamma, this great king was established in the Dhamma and conducted himself in the Dhamma among the Brahmins and the householders alike and among the town dwellers and the country folk. And he observed the Upasita days on the 14th, 15th and the 8th of a fortnight, okay? And he was following um, most of the way the Buddha was teaching, okay? But in the end, in 21, it's section 21, not 20. It's at the bottom of page 696. What's happening is the Buddha comes along and there's like a couple things that are a little bit missing. And the primary thing that is missing happens to be the Eightfold Path. So you listen in 21, he says, it was, he's talking to Ananda. Now Ananda, it may be that you think thus, certainly on the occasion, on that occasion, someone else was King Makhadeva who instituted that good practice, but it should not be regarded thus. This is now the Buddhist telling him, I was King Mahadeva on that occasion in another lifetime. I instituted that good practice and later generations continued that good practice instituted by me. But that kind of good practice does not lead all the way to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, and to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana, but only to reappearance in the Brahma world, okay? But there is this kind of good practice that has been instituted by me now, as the Buddha he means, which leads to complete disenchantment and then to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana. And what is that good practice? It is this eightfold path. That is, and then he gives the list of the parts of the Eightfold Path again. 
And this is the good practice instituted by me now, which leads to complete disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to Nibbana. Ananda, I say to you, continue this good practice instituted by me. Do not be the last man. Ananda, when there are two men living, he under whom there occurs a breach of this good practice, he is the last man among us. Therefore, Ananda, I say to you, continue this good practice instituted by me. Do not be the last man. There's an interesting story about Ananda. <clears throat> He, uh, at the time when the Buddha passed away and then they were going to have the first council, the only people who could go into the first council were the Arahats. Ananda was pressed to finish and become the Arahat. You see, he did not become the Arahat until before that council, the Arahat who had fruition, yeah? And so this is interesting, it points to that verification of that story, that that part was there. So um, 21, the adding of, in of the comprehension of the Buddha Dhamma to reach and complete with the disenchantment, the dispassion, the cessation, the peace, to direct knowledge, the enlightenment, Nirvana, and the full comprehensive practice of the harmonious eightfold path and using the practice of the right effort properly in the path. The next one I want to go to is 104, and that's on page 854 of your book, 854, 104, section 5. This one, is an emphasis on the importance of the entire Sangha. This is referring, interesting, this one, referring to the entire world Sangha. That means all the different practices of Buddhism combined, even if they're fighting with each other, <laughs> should not create a dispute on certain parts of the Dhamma because it would create a, a schism in the Sangha. And oh, you know, over time we saw a kind of schism happen between the Theravada and Mahayana, and then there also the ter the the Vajrayana being developed uh, in the north. You know, these things happen where it broke up. It was certain this would break up because um, just because of human beings, <laughs> mostly human beings, and um, the struggle for matching up the way I see it, matching up the culture with the teaching satisfactorily for all the people, the majority of people. So there are many things that are in the Buddhist teaching you would keep if you created something. And that's a tough call to say all the, you can read up on all the reasons and everything, but you say to yourself, but why do these things fractionalize? The United States is a real, uh, I'm not sure what the name, what, what enigma, an, an enigma is something that you just can't figure it out, I think, right? Yeah, just can't figure it out. It's a total enigma when it comes to Buddhism. When Bhante became the first monk to ever accept a position in the World Buddhist Council um, that was in Japan, the largest council that is held in the world with the largest center for supposedly all Buddhism to come there, but it's very expensive to travel to. Japan, I doubt very many people actually go there for a visit as a field trip, you know, that easily because of the cost it is to actually go to Japan and the difficulty of doing such a journey. But it was an effort to bring all the different groups together. That's what it was. And it was extraordinarily difficult. And even now is not settled all the points that people like to dispute and things. And some of them, I, you just can't understand why uh, they, they would be uh, 
there would be so much craving floating around this sort of thing for instance the one time i asked the um the organizer for that whole entire thing that whole entire project a question and i was totally shocked at the answer and i asked him what is the most difficult thing that you have faced in bringing together 30 or 40 countries that are buddhist into one place to have a major conference together what is the hardest thing that you've had to deal with out of these six or seven conferences that you have had so far? And the answer was the dining room. And I said, what are you talking about? I could not conceive of what he was talking about. And he said, you don't understand uh, between the vegetarians and those who are mixed, eating mixed diets. There is uh, this thing where the vegetarians have to eat in another dining room. I can't even fathom this lack of understanding craving and clinging where it cannot be let go of for a period of four days or five days time i cannot even grasp it i don't think anybody there could really give you any excuse why this could happen so it was a shock but this is the kind of thing that that, that if you don't understand how craving and clinging are really working and how you can tell if you're craving and clinging and what needs to be let go of. My goodness gracious. But in the United States, when Bhante accepted that position in the flight on the way back, uh, on the flight uh, over there when he was for the nominational tour, and then he's basically told he's accepted and then he's coming back, we're coming back on the flight. I, I'm doing research, you know, in the airports and stuff on how many different kinds of what well, how many buddhists are in the united states how many different temples and everything i came up with about 27 to 29 different practices groups that basically were incommunicado not communicating with each other really working together in a sense of unification for Buddhism, I was totally shocked. No one else could understand this. If you talk to a Burmese, they're all Buddhists. If you talk to the Thais, they're all Buddhists. If you go to Cambodia, they're all Buddhists. If you go to Nepal, they're all Buddhists. Bhutan is all Buddhists. And they didn't understand why, what I was talking about. I mean, now today there's like 37 different types that uh, this, a uh, filmmaker who was doing uh, types of, uh, would you say, uh, information films was doing, and he was just blown away because it's so uh, secular, divided up, you know, divided up. And the nature of human beings is a fascinating thing when you think about it, the necessity that each one of you has to belong to a group to be a, belong to a group. And how can we survive if we don't belong to a group? If we're not, <laughs> and I, you know, it's like, I wanna say, are you a citizen of so-and-so? I'm a citizen of the, of the earth. <laughs> I'm a member of the human beings. And to me, Buddhism is humanistic. It was done for all human beings, this, this whole practice, when you think about it. That's where I am. And I cannot get beyond saying that way, you know? And the only reason I'm Buddhist is because this is what I really want to study, what I really want to do, what I really want to understand. And yet, my goodness, I have robes on. <laughs> and I am, I am saying, uh, but that's the way it works. Okay, here we go, 104 section five. What do you think, Ananda? These things that I have taught you after directly knowing them, and that is the now he's talking now about the 37 pieces. Okay, and inside here, remember our 37 pieces. I have taught you after directly knowing them, that is the four foundations of mindfulness. Okay, the four right kinds um, of. Uh, I'm sorry, the four, four foundations of mindfulness, the four right kinds of uh, striving, and that's what that is, is the four steps of right effort, okay? The four bases of spiritual power. So there's your three fours, and then five faculties and five powers, 
there's two more, the five powers and five faculties, the seven enlightenment factors, the noble eightfold path. Do you see Ananda, even two monks who make differing assertions about these things? And actually it is true. It's pretty well aligned, pretty well aligned and survives pretty strongly, almost uh, the same way, but it may have gone a little bit out of alignment slightly, just a little bit slightly from view to perspective, the way we look at things. View, if you say right view, the view of the world. If I have the right perspective, I actually accomplish what they are calling right view. And by definition, later on, you'll see that. So when you look at the words, we change some of the words in the titles of these parts. Remember, to examine that we are fulfilling or practicing the old title of them by practicing the new wording. That's what I'm trying to get across to you. We haven't really changed anything. We've just fine-tuned how you're gonna reach the objective they wanted you to reach for the eight folds in the path. No, uh, and then he says, okay, do you see Ananda, anybody having different ideas about this? No, venerable sir, I do not see even two monks who make differing assertions about these things. But venerable sir, there are people who live differential towards the blessed one who might, when he has gone, create a dispute in the Sangha about livelihood and about the Padimoka, the rules for the monks. And such a dispute would be for the harm and unhappiness of many, for the loss and harm of suffering of both gods and humans. A dispute about livelihood or about the Padimoka would be trifling, Ananda. But should any dispute arise in, this, in the Sangha about the path or the way, such a dispute would be for the harm and unhappiness of many, for the loss and harm and suffering of gods and men. Now it says about the path and the way. Now the path is the eightfold path, okay? And the way is the practice of the meditation. For such a dispute would be of harm and unhappiness for many, for loss, harm and suffering, both gods and humans. So that's an important part to remember that once we slip on the practice, and I think that's what's happening at this time in the dispensation is slipping this slip away from four steps of right effort and defining effort as something that was hard and difficult and you know all the common definition for effort instead of the a uh, deeper definition for effort. And I've told you many times, if you want to examine that, you go to a good dictionary and you examine the initial, uh, you can actually do it on the phone, say define the word effort, but then you have to push more definitions. And what will come in for more definitions is describing what the practice is about, okay? Now go to 141. And this is on page 1098 um, in section 23, exposition of the truths. This is an exposition of the truths, okay? And this is a good place to go to get definitions for a lot of things. So you actually are gonna turn the page because we're gonna start at the bottom of 1099, section 23. And what, friends, is the noble truth of the way leading to this cessation of suffering? It is just this noble eightfold path. So now they're saying way. and um, But in the other place, they said path and way. Okay? But you can path or way. <laughs> so you see it written today as the eightfold way and the eightfold path. That's going that way. Okay, so... Now we take and listen to what they're defining this as harm. The, and what friends, we, the right, it's going to take you through these sections. What friends is right view? 
knowledge of suffering, knowledge of the origin of suffering, knowledge of the cessation of suffering. Aha! And knowledge of the way leading to the cessation of suffering is called right view. So they're using what? They're using the four noble truths as the steps for the solution in a harmonious perspective is leading you to that way. Okay? And you're doing that. The four noble truths are met each time you practice the cycle of right effort. You should have done that by now. When you write the practice of right effort, you then put the four noble truths over here and you show which parts of the right effort is solving the questions of the noble, the four noble truths at 25 and what friends is right intention we say harmonious imaging intention of renunciation intention of non ill will intention non cruelty this is called right intention what do they mean by intention of renunciation renouncing renouncing the opposites of ill will uh, non ill will and the opposites of non cruelty so that's ill will and cruelty, renouncing ill will, renouncing cruelty, okay? It's okay. The next one is, and what friends is right speech? What is harmonious communication? Abstaining from false speech, abstaining from malicious speech, abstaining from harsh speech, abstaining from idle chatter, and this is called right speech, hmm? yeah? And what friends, is right action, abstaining from killing living beings, abstaining from taking what is not given, abstaining from misconduct in sensual pleasures. This is called right action, true. But we go one step further into mind, one step above that and say, harmonious action is the harmonious movement of mind's attention. So let's look at that a minute. Are we violating anything? No, because we are saying that if you have the harmonious uh, movement of mind's attention, it is going to move towards the wholesome objective, which is abstaining from killing. It's the support for these things, support for it. So you're, you're absolutely, you're going. One professor in Burma told me once when we were, developing the uh, wholesome, the harmonious path and refining it, he said, you guys are working at a, a higher level, like another level above where they're talking about sometimes. And I have been told by uh, some very honorable monks that what we teach you is um, we are teaching you what a monks would be taught. But you see, there's not supposed to be a restriction from you being able to understand this. And if you can understand it, there's nothing wrong with teaching this to uh, the lay people more clearly this way. It's not reserved for monks. There was no knowledge reserved only for monks. With that, you see, that's something that we have to remember. And what, friends, is right livelihood? Here, a noble disciple, having abandoned wrong livelihood, earns his living by right livelihood, and this is called a right livelihood. We, we go one step beyond that and say harmonious lifestyle. And what we're saying is, what is that? It's a place, whether it's a tiny cottage, it doesn't matter, or a one-room hut, it doesn't matter. If you set up one corner where you can sit with a little kind of screen behind it and have an altar and be alone in that space, that when you're there, people will allow you to be quiet and pursue your meditation, a place where you can have a space alone time. Each person who lives there can, you see? And um, your lifestyle is correct with the form of livelihood that it is, uh, it is operating. And um, I had a friend once who was, um, wow, she was really upset. And I said, uh, why, why are you, I said, why are you working at this factory? They're making 
delivery systems for nuclear weapons. But I'm not making the weapon, she said. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not making the weapon. And I didn't. I didn't. Um, I didn't make the parts of the weapon. I only made the delivery system. <laughs> and I'm there. Okay. And then she got sick later. She got very, very disturbed by what was happening because she didn't want to work there anymore. And she got very depressed. And I, she said, "What do I do?" I said, "You got to change jobs. You have to change jobs." And she did, she did. Another one is what friends is right effort? What is harmonious practice? Here, now listen carefully. Here a student awakens enthusiasm. We always say enthusiasm instead of zeal. It's like enthusiasm for the non-arising of unarisen, evil, unwholesome states. And he makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind, and he strives. Okay? Now, the part that gets mixed up is zeal for the non-arising of unarisen, evil, unwholesome states. At some point, someone, somewhere, decided to just say we have to just put a cork on it and suppress it subdue it and make it stay down we don't know when and we don't know why because if you understand the unwholesome states what the unwholesome states that arise are the distractions and you learn how the distractions operate then you find out what their nutriment is, and then you withdraw their nutriment. So to have zeal for the non-arising of unarism, even evil unwholesome states before they come, would be to practice the knowledge that you learned about how a hindrance or a distraction act, how it operates. And when you do that, you withdraw. So to actually um, practice, if you were, let me show you real quick. If I was to practice the non-arising of unarisen evil and wholesome states by trying to make them stop, that would be called careless attention on the distraction. In the Samyutta Nikaya, on page 1597, when you read the discussions about what it is that feeds the uh, evil unwholesome states and makes them bigger and stronger and last longer and return to bother you again, it's careless attention. So my personal attention is the food for these arising problems and I remove the food if I know that, I don't have to suppress them. They will fade away. They will just not have any food and they will fade away. Second step, he awakens enthusiasm for the abandoning of the arisen unwholesome state. That's good, or good, abandon it. And he makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. Once again, somewhere along the line, we got more of a definition for letting go of this, I have this in my hand, letting go of it, abandoning it meant abandon it. Let it go, release it, okay? And this one says abandoning, but in the other same paragraphs throughout the text, it says release, release the unwholesome and he makes an effort uh, and he strives, okay? And then the third step is he awakens the same, uh, uh, the zeal for the arising of the unarisen wholesome state. So he wants to bring a wholesome state up in place of it. He makes an effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. He carries it out. He brings up that replacement thought or, and then he can, he awakens zeal and, he also, for the continuance, non-disappearance, the strengthening, the increase and fulfillment by development of arisen wholesome states. He develops more states that feel the same way as that state and is healthy and wholesome to make more and more and more 
and he's letting go of the other unwholesome states. He is carrying forth uh, the development of new neural pathways in his brain for change in his behavior. He is letting go of the old uh, neural pathways by not feeding that old habitual reaction anymore. And he is creating new responses. And he makes his effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. And this is called right effort. So this one puts is a funny paragraph because it puts right effort and right striving all in one paragraph. It's a little bit different than the ones we find in different places that are just talking about the four steps of right effort and ending with right effort or right striving we finally figured out is when right effort happens in your mind automatically, okay? So this one is really important because this one is distinctly about uh, the practice and how it works and operates. The next one is observation and what friends is right mindfulness. A student abides contemplating the body as a body ardent, fully aware and mindful, having put away um, desire and, uh, and he abides contemplating feelings as feelings the same way. He abides contemplating mind as mind the same way. He abides contemplating mind objects as mind objects same way, impersonally, not personally, but impersonally. And then he, uh, he continues having put away covetousness and grief for the world. This is called his right mindfulness. So we got this one right, right head on. It is observation. It is a specific kind of observation, very skilled observation. You got that one right too. What friends is right concentration or um, right or collectedness, right? Collectedness. Here, quite secluded. Now he takes you into, he takes you into what happens. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but no, I can. No, I don't need to. But when you have this concentration at a proper tone, productive level, and it is taking you into the path. Here's where it confirms quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. He enters upon and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. And with the stilling of the thinking and examining thought, he enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind without uh, thinking or examining thought with joy and happiness born of this balanced concentration. With the fading away as well of joy, he abides in equanimity. He is mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body. He enters upon and abides in the third jhana on account of which the noble ones announce he has a pleasant abiding with who has equanimity and is mindful. And with the abandoning of the pleasure and pain and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, he enters upon and abides in the fourth jhana, which is neither pain nor pleasure, purity of mind due to equanimity. And this is called this right collectedness of mind or productive concentration. This is called the noble truth of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. So that takes that one. If we jump over to 149 on page 1138, 1138, 149, Maha Salyatanika, Maha Salyatanika Sutta. This one, <clears throat> in section 10 is just going to talk about all 37, it's a list of the 37 
requisites of enlightenment. But at the bottom says something very important. And what it's saying is making mention that the seven enlightenment factors come to fulfillment in him by development. And these two things, serenity and insight, occur in him yoked evenly together. And that's what we're saying. This is where our name of the practice comes from, the tranquil wisdom insight meditation. The tranquil wisdom is the samatha, the serenity, the insight. So you have to make sure in the name when you're building a website or you're building anything about this, you need, it's not tranquil wisdom meditation. We have to check this and make sure it's not there because there is tranquil wisdom meditation floating around. And there are centers teaching tranquil wisdom meditation that is not this meditation. This is tranquil wisdom insight meditation where the the samatha and vipassana are yoked together like this, and then they're pulling the wagon like that. The two bulls or the two horses are pulling, yoked together, just like harness is over the two of them. And it's how this is meditation is working, how it's happening. So from there, there is one place to go, and it's in, uh, if you go to, a, it's a series of notes, I want to just read them to you. In that sutta, there were some notes. You start with 13, note number 1341. It's on page 1364 of the book, 1364 of the book. And it's 1341 through 43, and then you include 44. So just listen to these notes. It's kind of cool. The, <clears throat> the eight. Oh, I got to take some water here. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> okay, the eight factors of the path mentioned here seem to pertain to the preliminary or the mundane portion of the path, meaning outside of the the jhanas, okay? And then the first, um, the first um, commentary, the master, com this is the, this is the Majima Nikaya Atka, they say, and it's the commentary that was written on the Majima Nikaya, okay, that came afterwards. It identifies them with the factors possessed by a person at the highest level of insight development immediately prior to the emergence of the uh, super mundane path, okay? So this is verifying what we see happening in this practice. And in this stage, only the former five path factors are actively operative. The three factors of the morality group have been purified prior to the undertaking of the insight meditation. Now, this is talking in terms of um, the insights maybe happening outside of the uh, Samatha practice. That's okay, all right, here. But what I'm saying is, um, in order for the insights to happen, the way I'm reading this, in order for the insights to occur, the proper conditions must arise just the way conditions must arise for you to move from jhana to jhana, insight to insight as you're moving along the things that you're becoming aware of in your insights. They happen only if a person is stabilized in their morality. So why am I pointing this out? Well, because the person who has to go six, seven, eight years just to reach Sotapanna, okay, that person is going from a retreat where they keep the precepts and leaving and just breaking them and going back into life and doing whatever they want and then coming back to retreat again and again and again and again until finally they reach a condition where it might occur. Whether they can maintain it when it does occur is questionable when they go home. If they're so used to just going back home again, back into 
life, as they would say, but this is supposedly changing your life so that when you go back into life, you take it with you. And this is what's missing. And so you cannot, we know that the person cannot maintain the purity and conditions they need for insight if they are doing things that are breaking precepts outside of the retreat because it leaves scars on you. And when you come into retreat, then you hit a block, then you have to back up, then you have to forgive, then you have to take your precepts, then you have to clean the slate, then you have to take your plane off again and start again on the journey each time. It's not, it's not like you landed for a while and went home and kept your precepts. So the ones that are not, are stumbling and falling and stumbling and falling and saying, well, how, how can, are people who are basically hunting for immediate gratification, I'd like it in a box. May I please have it so I can keep it on the shelf and have it whenever I want it. And it doesn't work that way. You've got to keep this up and turn it into the new track for life, the new changed track for life and let go of the old habits and the old breakings of the precepts completely. But when the super mundane path arises, all eight of the factors occur simultaneously. You see, there it is. They all occur simultaneously, but they can't if they haven't been practiced while you were away from the retreat. The three factors of the morality group exercising the function of eradicating defilements responsible for moral transgression in speech, action, and livelihood are occurring, you see? So it's all what I'm saying is you can't just have this cake and you baked it and then go home and try to do it again without three of the ingredients and then come back, and, you see? Okay, so MA also is saying that this refers to the simultaneous arising of serenity and insight. There we are, the simultaneous arising of serenity and insight. This is what we wanna make sure Bonte hears about this note, number 1342. Somebody needs to write him a note, please. You know, this note is in here. It's not just in 149 at 149.10. Here it sits again inside this note, you see? The former is uh, present and uh, the heading of right uh, concentration, the latter under the heading of right view, impersonal perspective. You have to maintain that impersonal perspective. You have to have that operating. You take it, start taking it personally, you destroy, you destroy an imbalance, the first three at the top of the eightfold path. Now these are the four, the, this is 1430, uh, 1343 now, these are the four functions exercised by the super mundane path, fully understanding the truth of suffering, boy, abandoning the cause of suffering, the craving and clinging as much as possible, realizing the cessation of suffering, seeing it in the path as, as in the practice of the tranquil wisdom insight meditation, seeing it every time you do the relaxed step, watch it closer. It's right there. No craving at all, total complete emptiness and no internal feeling of tension or tightness at all. No craving, it's gone maybe the size of the top of a straight pin, but it's there, <laughs> and developing the path leading to the end of suffering. There you go. And then at 1344, one thing that is he is saying is here, serenity and insight represent the entire eightfold path. Twim, remember Bonte gave a talk about Twim represents the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path and the Dependent Origination. It, it, it's all there. If you do a summation of your practice, I've done it, I can show you on the um, uh, one of the um, PowerPoint presentations, the summary, it summarizes what happens every cycle that you practice. It summarizes in those two little slides, you see? And it allows you to see clearly the Four Noble Truths understand dependent origination and the three characteristics completely. That's what it's doing. So you get really excited about that one, okay? And the last one, uh, those are the notes. It was worth going over there to the notes, I think. 
And then in 151, we go to 151.18 now on 1144, page 1144. Okay. Now this is about 18, but I'm going to start reading at 10 so that you can understand. And it's not that long because from 13 to 19 is just repetition. So it's not very long at all. Okay, so listen to this now. Again, Sariputta, this is called the uh, Pindipata Parisutta, Parisuddhi Sutta. There you go. Pindipata Parisuddhi Sutta. Again, Sariputta, a monk should consider thus. Are the five hindrances abandoned in me? Now, this is something that the student can ask themselves as they're working, as they're going along. You should be asking these kinds of questions, which you'll see in just a minute when I give you the conclusion of this whole thing. And uh, Sariputta, a, a monk should consider, a we'll say a student should consider, are the five hindrances abandoned in me? If by reviewing this, he knows the five hindrances are not abandoned in me, then he should make an effort to abandon those five hindrances. I like it because it says abandon them. Abandon them. Do not start World War III with them. Abandon them, okay? Abandon them. Um, then he should make an effort to abandon those five hindrances. And if by reviewing, he knows thus the five hindrances are abandoned in me, then he can abide happy and glad, training day and night in wholesome states, do what he wants. He can practice determinations. He can practice living for a day in one particular jhana. He can use these, everything that he knows he can practice with that way. Again, Sariputta, um, a student should consider thus, are the five aggregates affected by clinging fully understood in me? And we can say, are the five aggregates when affected by clinging, are they fully understood by me? If by reviewing, he knows thus that these five uh, aggregates affected by clinging are not fully understood by him, then he should make an effort to fully understand those five aggregates affected by clinging. But if by reviewing, he knows the five aggregates affected by clinging are fully understood by him, then he can abide happy and glad, training day and night in wholesome states. Again, Sariputta, a student should consider thus, are the four foundations of mindfulness developed in me? If by reviewing, he knows thus, the four foundations of mindfulness are not developed in me, then he should make an effort to develop this four foundations of mindfulness. But if by reviewing, he knows thus, the four foundations of mindfulness, are developed in me, then he can abide happy and glad, training day and night in wholesome states. Now, then he can say again, Sariputta, a student should consider thus, are the four right kinds of striving developed in me? Next question, are the four bases of spiritual power developed in me? Are the five faculties developed in me? Are the five powers developed in me? Are the seven factors in, developed in me? Is the Eightfold Path developed in me? Are serenity and insight developed in me? And if by reviewing this, he knows thus, serenity and insight are not developed in me or the other items on the list, then he should make an effort to develop them to be such. But if by reviewing, he knows the serenity and insight are developed in me, he can abide happy and glad training day and night in wholesome states. There you go. So your practice is serving you well to 
look at all these things, and there are lots of other notations for this, but most of them are just lists appearing in a paragraph here, a paragraph there. And so what I pulled out was what I wanted to show you and give you a feel for how your practice is fulfilling this. Now we did one page for you and I couldn't find, I thought I had a, um, I'll try to find this for you because I know I have it somewhere. Um, I have this as a single page, but this is a page that was inserted into uh, one of our training books for retreat. It's called a checkup, a checkup for progress on your noble eightfold path. It's time to ask yourself, these questions for a personal checkup concerning your own eightfold path development. You should ask it at least once a month, maybe twice a month or however you want to do it. Am I really following this path? And you ask yourself the following questions to see how you are doing. Number one, what is my perspective in life? Do I impersonally look at what is essentially going on or do I take it personally and get wrapped up in what is unessential while it is happening? That's the first question. That shows you the effect of having a personal or impersonal perspective. Number two, what kind of images do I carry around in my mind? Are the images I take in my mind, wholesome and supportive for my life each day, or are they unwholesome and take me in an unhealthy direction, an unwholesome direction, take me away from my life energy, or do they feed, does it feed me? Number three, how do I communicate with this world? How do I use thoughts, words, and actions, the thoughts, words, and actions of my body and speech to communicate each and every day. Number four, am I aware of the movement of my mind's attention while I am doing all tasks during a day? Do I see the impersonal nature of what is happening or do I believe that everything is part of me, is mine, and is myself. You check it. Number five, does my lifestyle support my meditation and overall development of my life? Do I have somewhere in my living space I can spend alone time to contemplate and practice my meditation? Number six, do I keep my practice going in daily life? Do I understand how to use TWIM all the time through all the interactions in my life? And do I keep smiling? Number seven, have I developed a skilled observation so I can see how things are happening in my life. Am I able to understand how human cognition or the dependent origination process occurs when disturbing emotions come up in life? Can I reflect on this? Reflecting on the symptom of a rising craving and let go of it? Do I see that craving clearly? Number eight, is my mind's attention more gently collected or am I carrying tension and tightness with me as I am going about my day? When I do my meditation, is my focus light and uplifted or is it heavy with tension and tightness because I am trying too hard? Lighten up. Smile. Tickle your toes. <laughs> you know, there's a wonderful, um, there's, do you know what Yiddish is? I don't know if you know what Yiddish is. 
Philadelphia. It's a Jewish language that was spoken in Germany, a sort of a goth, a, a, the, a language of the people in religion and everything. And I had a friend who was uh, Jewish and she worked for me. It was the most wonderful experience I ever had. She worked for me in my, in my company and we were human resources placing people in jobs and everything. We had to be happy all the time, you know, to interview people coming in to interview for jobs. She taught me a few little things I can still remember. For mischt, I'm for mischt, I mixed up. And for bludgeoned, for bludgeoned is confused. But my favorite one, I'm for mischt, I'm for bludgeoned, she said, I don't know what to do. And I would turn to her and say what she taught me to say. Una flet mir un pipic. Flet mir un pipic. It means just go tickle your belly button. <laughs> Is that a ridiculous thing? Just tickle your belly button. <laughs> and it was like an uplifting thing we had in the office because sometimes we would have uh, we'd say an ugly experience with somebody who owed money to come in and pay or something about complaining about a job or something and have to go through that. And we just look at each other and go, flake me own kicking. <laughs> and they had such an uplifting way of handling everything, you know? It was uh, a precious thing. Yeah, I don't know, I can't remember many of them but I remember those three. And I used to use them with my children for many years. <laughs> so I throw these questions. Let's have questions for about five minutes anyway. Does anybody have a question about this? Hmm? Do you, do, I want to know, do you feel like your twin is fulfilling for you? What you need with this eightfold path? Do you see how it's working with it? Yeah, and how the smile is in each one of the pieces. I sent you some pictures about that. Yeah, I do have, I do have a comment. Okay. If you if you allow. Yeah, Ulysses. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, I can yeah. hear you. Now. So yeah. let me see if I put the video. It's gonna be a little bit skewed. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, um, um, you know, I did my first retreat with you back in September, and then I did another one uh, recently, and uh, it was late January when we did the second one. And uh, the one thing my friends asked me, like, how, you know, um, your life has turned around, you know, you... You have such good luck. That's what they say. <laughs> you have such good luck. Everything is really working out for you. And what they don't realize is that there is an effort to all of this, which <laughs> is the this right effort that we have been talking about. I mean, yeah. obviously there there is a combination of things that are going on. You know, the, uh, the you know the right conditions you know have been arising as well. But it's more like when you're smiling at all time. I feel like you're inviting the good things to you. You're inviting them, you're allowing them in, and you accept also whatever is not happening correctly for you or whatever is not happening in a, I would say in a positive frame, you accept it as, as a lesson. You also accept it as something that you need to be working on, that you need to be seeing as, uh, okay, well, yeah, I see, I see how this is an issue. And um, so I just wanted to make a comment that, yeah, that, that there is that right effort that you have to put in, and it's a very simple right effort if you think about it when it, when it comes to just smiling, just like, just a little bit of a smile. Every five minutes you take, you know, you pinch yourself and you say, just smile, whatever happened, just smile. And it, it, is, it, it, it sounds silly, you know, like sounds like you're doing like something most adults will consider stupid, but <laughs> um, it really has made a big difference in my life, I feel. Yeah, that's cool. I know you are all already you couple of times you mentioned to me too. people would say what 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 are you getting what, where are you getting this. <laughs> and I've had I've had other students come to me and go back to their office and start 
working after a retreat and you know they've done really really well and they carried it home with them and when they went back to work people are coming up saying where, where did you go did you go to a spa where did you go <laughs> they felt like there was such a difference it, in the person being able to get through anything in and, the office and i and i think another another important part about smiling and applying right effort to life is that Sometimes you need to hear criticism from people. Sometimes you do need to hear what, you know, that feedback of something that isn't working. And when we are stuck in the personal view, you know, that everything is mine, everything is for me, everything, you know, we, we are not so keen on being able to just, you know, just listen to that, to that criticism or advice. And um, uh, when you are operating from, you know, from a smile point of view, from like, this person is not wishing me ill. This person is just mirroring what I need to be hearing, what I need to be seeing. Is like, I think that's like, um, what I guess what I'm trying to say is when you're operating from the smile all the time, it is easier to just sit down and listen to someone saying some pretty harsh things about you. You listen to them and you say, okay, all right, I see that, thank you. You know, and you can actually thank them for the effort because they're spending time telling you things that are ultimately gonna be beneficial for you to change if you have to change them. And I think that's probably about the hardest thing for every human being to just accept the criticism, to accept the feedback, to accept that, you know, that maybe there are things about you that are not working. There's a really good reason for it because you're getting in the way. So, yeah, that's, that's it. You're absolutely right. Uh, productive criticism, you know, critical critical analysis of our work is really important for us to get better if we can't listen to that. And it's hard for managerial people to learn how to do this for people. It is hard. And we have to be able to do it to our staffs. It's one of the hardest things. You know, I'll, t I'll tell you how I'll handle it and you'll kind of get a giggle out of it. But when I had my business at one point, uh, my husband and I uh, decided that this one person had to, had to be let go. This person had to be let go. And he said, you have to take care of it. I just could not even fathom telling somebody they didn't have a job and I had to let them go. I, I didn't know I was beside myself what to do, you know? And I I even, I when my husband came home, I was hiding in the closet. He said, what are you hiding in the closet? I don't want to discuss it. Did you do it today? No, I didn't do it. How can I do this? And he said, you're hiding in a closet. And anyway, what happened? I, this went on for like about four days. And he said, I'm going to make you do this. I'm going to make you be a better owner and a manager. You're going to learn how to do this. You have to do it or you're not going to be successful. And I said, thou stay in the closet. You go take care of it tomorrow. <laughs> you know? And he said, no, you have to go do it. And then I went in the next day and you know what happened? She came in and she told me she had to quit. <laughs> she came in to me, told me she really was terribly sorry, but she just didn't think this job was going so well and she needed, she wasn't producing what she should be. And she, she told me all the things that I needed to tell her, you know, she told me, and she said, I really need to quit. I need to have another job. And I said, if you need any help to find another job, we'll, I'll help you. I'll talk to other employers for you. I'm so sorry it didn't work. And I went home that night and I have this big smile on my face. And he said, did you tell her? And I said, it's taken care of. <laughs> I did a great job. <laughs> you know, so if you, if you put out the vibes long enough, I wasn't sure what was happening in that time this is what actually happened. Now I can explain. I was putting out these vibes to the universe. I need help. I need help. Hello, somebody in the universe, please help me. And they sent the woman in the next day and she quit. That's what happened. So, but she told me everything he said to me, did you discuss the things you were supposed to? Absolutely. I did. I didn't say she brought them up and I answered. I just I just, you know, I'm one of these people that is kind of silly because in the old days, you know, I would sometimes, in living in the country before I was a nun, we would just go to the used clothing store and buy these clothes or we could get them like for a dollar, a brand new shirt or something. And sometimes I would have a really nice dress. And so where did you find that dress? Oh, you know, I got it for 50 cents. 
I would just blow it. You know, I would just ruin the whole thing. And somebody with me would have, why did you tell her that? You could have really had, I said, why well, did tell them the truth? They should go and get one too. <laughs> What's that one? Well, they can go tomorrow and they get one. My my daughter wanted to buy these skirts that came from India and they had the little layers, you know, on the skirts that came down like this. These skirts were being sold in the United States for anywhere from fifty to a hundred dollars a skirt. And she wanted a couple of these skirts for for um for, uh, for school when she was in college, you know? And I said, listen, uh, when I go back to the center in Missouri, I'm gonna send you a box of these skirts. Oh, sure you are, mom. Well, I went back and I went to the used clothing store, had these beautiful skirts from the 1960s. Hello, same skirts. I had them, you know, cleaned and folded real neatly and sent them to her. She was so excited. They were all wearing them. And she said, where did you get them? Where store did you get them from? I said, it's just a little, little boutique here in the woods, in the forest, down in a small town in Missouri. That's where I got them. I wasn't going to tell her the whole truth, but that's what they were. Just skirts that people had given away and they were all there and some, a lot of people didn't want to wear them and in fashion fashion is the eternal circle for women eternal circle that goes around and it just came down like this and here was my daughter bang and uh <laughs> you know 50 cents a skirt a dollar a skirt you know same exact skirt anyway anybody else have a question yeah Sounds like we're having too much fun now. <laughs> okay, so Flatmere and Pippic this week, if you have any doubts about anything, just tickle, you know. Okay, and um, I always wanted to know what a belly button was for. <laughs> but anyway, okay, uh, I need you all to smile this week. Um, and then next week uh, we will start a new program but i have to figure out any questions you have about the 37 requisites that you have now we've done all 37 of these okay and we've looked at everything so back yourselves up before we start the class next week i want to hear any questions you have about the 37 okay and then uh, we will move on to where I haven't decided which path to take. I'm just like Mark Twain here. <laughs> I'm not sure, but we're gonna look at, uh, we could. We might look at an, in, I found a couple of suttas in this research that was pretty, pretty interesting. And we might look at one of them that's an unusual sutta. So we'll, I'll let you know as we go along, okay? So are we, everybody happy? Yes? Blink your little lights or something, that's good. <laughs> Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Perel, if it's possible, I'd like to call you after the meeting. Is it possible? Yeah. Okay. I promise I'll call. Anybody else? Uh, you have any questions with your practice? Please write me at um, uh, kantikema2 at gmail.com. Kantikema2, number two, at um gmail.com and no there's only one of me but i <laughs> that's the second one <laughs> number two try of using gmail i think is what that was <laughs> okay okay let's do a closing prayer may suffering ones be suffering free and the fierce may the greed shed all greed and may all and be, may all be find relief. Find relief. May all be may all bear this merit. Share the merit of ours and for the reputation of all kinds of happiness. All kinds of beings. May beings, may beings inhabiting, inhabiting space, space in our devas and nagas of mighty power. Bear this merit. Share of this merit. May they long. May they long protect. The Buddha's dispensation. The Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, 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 sadhu.
uh, do 